people who weren't around back in the day often ask what makes Final Fantasy VI so good. Why is such an old game so important to so many people? But these are not the questions you should be asking. A lot has happened in gaming in the last 29 years. And even though Final Fantasy VI is still a solid game in the hands of the right player, its true value lies in what it meant to those of us who got to play it when it was brand new. Because what makes Final Fantasy VI one of the greatest games ever made cannot be measured in how well the gameplay, story, and music have held up, but rather how groundbreaking the whole package was in 1994. In this video, I'll show you what Final Fantasy VI was like, how it built upon and changed the formula from the previous games, and how it offered more freedom than ever before, but sometimes struggled to balance it against the linear narrative. This is a retrospective, but not a very objective one. It's impossible for me to be unbiased about Final Fantasy VI, so I'm not even going to try. This is not a review or a historical document. This is a love letter to Final Fantasy VI, the first video game I truly, deeply loved. The first ever masterpiece JRPG. Just to be clear, this video contains spoilers for almost every single aspect of Final Fantasy VI. And fair warning, it's gonna get emotional. Final Fantasy VI was released in Japan on April 2nd, 1994, about a year and four months after Final Fantasy V. But many of us once knew this game as Final Fantasy III, because by the time the game made it to North America half a year later, only the original Final Fantasy and Final Fantasy IV had seen Western releases. As a result, the Japanese Final Fantasy VI became the American Final Fantasy III, and the confusion would last a lifetime. In some ways, Final Fantasy VI marked the end of an era. It was the last 2D game in the mainline series, the last exclusive Nintendo title, and the last of the series to not get a worldwide release. It would be another eight years before Final Fantasy VI was first released in Europe, but that didn't stop the game from spreading beyond its official markets. In an era before most people even knew the internet existed, Final Fantasy VI developed a cult following, even before it was out. Hardcore RPG enthusiasts imported the game from the US at extortionate prices, modded our consoles to play region-locked games, and waited with bated breath for the first look at the treasure the world had tried to deny us. Expectations were sky high, and Final Fantasy VI smashed them. From the very first moment, Final Fantasy VI announced loud and clear that this would be a different experience from other games. The title screen shows dark clouds shot through with sheets of lightning. Dramatic organ and synthesized choir gives way to a mysterious piano clinking, ushering us into a world of mystery and grand adventure. A series of sweeping panoramic shots, accompanied by a foreboding soundtrack, sets the stage for the story, using text narration to tell us about the devastating war of the Magi of long ago, of the disappearance and imminent resurrection of magic, and of the conflict between the free people of the world and an oppressive empire. As the music dies down, it's replaced by the sound of the howling wind, and three figures appear on a cliff overlooking a mountainside town, riding on the backs of imposing war machines. Leaping right into the thick of the story, we are drawn in by the soldier's mysterious task, and left with burning questions waiting to be answered. Who is the strange girl the soldiers brought along? And why is she wearing a slave crown? What's an esper? And why does the Empire want it? And what's going to happen when they get it? No matter how many times I see it, Final Fantasy VI's opening always sends shivers down my spine. It wasn't the first video game to have a dramatic beginning, but this was the most epic by far. The music was grand, dramatic, and cinematic. The opening was rich with feeling and mystique. It was a moody, brooding intro that gave the impression that there was a whole lot more to this story than met the eye. It gave the feeling there was a whole world out there beyond the barren cliffs and the snowy fields. 
and by the time the mournful flute of terror's theme began to play, as the Magitek armors marched across the field of snow towards the distant lights of Narsh, and the credits began to roll across the screen, we were just as hooked as if we'd started up a sci-fi epic on the big screen. But this was only the beginning. We were in for an experience of a lifetime. And it all began with Final Fantasy VI's Brave New World. Final Fantasy VI tells the story of the Returners, a ragtag band of rebels fighting to liberate their homes from the oppressive Gestalian Empire, which seeks to dominate the world using the lost power of magic. Drawing inspiration from the Japanese Final Fantasy II, the sixth game focused not on a world of crystals and kings, but on a war between an evil empire and the free people who resist them, fought with equal parts swords, magic, and machines. And much of the story's power came from the game's unique world. Although Final Fantasy had always had a dash of science fiction ingredients like airships, mechanical monsters, and orbital fortresses, these elements were always painted with a brush of mystery cryptic monuments to the ingenuity of ancient civilizations. But the Final Fantasy series has always been about trying new things, making bold moves, and always looking forward. To put it frankly, Hironobu Sakaguchi and his team had grown tired of standard fantasy tropes. They wanted to explore something new, something that had the look and feel of the Industrial Revolution. This was a world where magic and machinery coexisted, a world where the Empire's spell-slinging elite rode mechanical monstrosities called Magitek armor into battle, a world of airships, steam engines, and coal mines, but also swordsmen, dragons, and mages. The enemies you fought wore fascist uniforms just as often as medieval armor, the environments you explored weren't just the usual caves and dungeons, but also mechanized factories, military camps, and high-rise buildings in rundown slums. The game's assortment of heroes also reflected this broader perspective. Many of the traditional fantasy-inspired jobs from the previous games were cast out. No more paladins, dark knights, and dragoons. Instead, we got a machinist, a gambler, a Magitek soldier, and a slam-dancing Moogle. For better or worse, Final Fantasy VI was the first game in the series to do some genuine world-building. The whimsical fantasy worlds of the first five games drew inspiration from the sword and sorcery genre and the wild and crazy early days of Dungeons and Dragons, where an adventure might start you off in the court of a medieval king but end on a high-tech space station full of lasers and robots. These were worlds where anything went, and where every turn of the story could land you in a new and bizarre environment. But they were also worlds that lacked cohesion, where the pieces of the puzzle didn't really fit together. Final Fantasy VI offered a more bespoke experience, a world deliberately crafted to provide a certain mood, where what you saw at the start was more or less what you'd get. And even though the consistent world-building might have stripped the game of some of its sense of wonder, this new way of thinking would come to pay off. When the game's setting could be custom-made to drive home the themes and ground the characters, a stronger world meant stronger stories. And with the exception of an intentional throwback in Final Fantasy IX, this style of world-building has dominated the series ever since. Final Fantasy VI's unique world was one of the game's most memorable aspects, and it ended up paying off right from the start, in a rather surprising way, the role Magitek played in teaching the game. Final Fantasy VI pretty much set the standard for what we've come to expect from a classic Japanese RPG, but the core of the game was not much different from the previous titles. You explore a large world full of towns and dungeons, controlling a party of up to four characters. Enemies are fought in random encounters, and battles play out using Active Time Battle, a real-time, menu-based combat system where you give the characters commands from a list each time their ATB gauge fills up. But there were some welcome improvements. 
The option to cycle through the characters using the L and R buttons made fiddling with the game's menus a lot smoother. Shops finally gave you a preview of who would actually benefit from the gear you were thinking of buying. And running from battle got a bit of an overhaul. Instead of fleeing as a group, Final Fantasy VI's heroes escape individually, with some characters being faster than others at getting away. By far the most important addition to the active time battle formula was something that seems so obvious to us now. It's hard to even imagine the previous games didn't have it. For the first time in the series, Final Fantasy VI lets you delay a character's turn by switching to an ally whose A to B gauge is also full. The fact that you no longer had to take the character's turns in the order they came up opened up all sorts of new possibilities for clever strategies and quick decision making, making combat run better than ever. The game begins when we take control of Terra, a mysterious young woman enslaved by the Empire for her magical powers. And as the story kicks off, Terra and her two Imperial handlers enter the town of Narsh in search of the mysterious Esper, recently unearthed in the town's mines. Riding the Empire's ultimate weapon, the intimidating mechanical Magitek armors. From the perspective of modern game design principles, starting the game with the characters riding Magitek armor gives kind of the wrong idea. Because there's only two more places in the whole game where the characters get a brief taste of Magitek power. And one of them is an optional dungeon. But even though Final Fantasy VI could have done a lot more with this concept, starting the heroes off on the backs of strange mechs, kept things fresh for returning fans, showcased the overwhelming power of the Empire, and gave the game's intro a sneaky kind of hidden benefit, an invisible tutorial of the combat system. The raid on Narsh that kicks off Final Fantasy VI was designed to give returning players a refresher on the basics of combat as well as bring new players up to speed. And since Terra and her companions are so powerful in their Magitek armor, the opening sequence was an opportunity to take your time, make mistakes and experiment with the controls without having to worry about getting a game over. It was also the perfect way to introduce a couple of new challenges that added a twist to the game's random encounters. In addition to the familiar back attack and preemptive strike, where one of the parties would get a chance to strike first in battle, Final Fantasy VI also introduced two new attack formations. The pincer attack, where the enemy hits you from both sides at once, and the side attack, where the heroes return the favor. Pincer attacks can be absolutely brutal, but by introducing them while the heroes were riding Magitek armor, the game gave you a chance to feel the new mechanic out in a safe environment. And the same could be said for the game's first real hurdle, the Welk, which continued the tradition from Final Fantasy IV and V of having the game's first boss demonstrate the fundamental principle of active time battle, the fact that timing matters. Making a mistake here would teach the player a valuable lesson, and Magitek armor meant the game didn't have to pull its punches. In the depths of Narsh's minds, Terra and her companions reach their objective, the frozen remains of an Esper, a race of mysterious creatures of magic, long departed from the world. As Terra makes first contact with the ancient being, the resulting disaster wipes out her companions, but awakens something within her she didn't know was there. And here, Final Fantasy VI puts one of the greatest strengths of the game's storytelling on full display. Just like in Final Fantasy IV and V, much of Final Fantasy VI's story is told on the combat screen. But this time, the game system gave the scenario writers a lot more leeway. Characters could move freely about the field, posing and acting out their emotions, and special effects could elaborate certain elements of the plot. The magical energy that sparks between Terra and the Esper isn't a recycled spell or ability, but a special handcrafted animation for this important scene. These new capabilities made in-combat scenes a lot more dynamic, and some of the game's most significant moments were ones that played out on the battlefield. Edgar's reaction to Terra's first use of magic, Cyan and Sabin's meeting with Gao on the Velt, 
Kefka's shocking murder of General Leo. These are some of the scenes that stick the most in my memory, and a lot of their power came from the way they were told. Much has been said about the role of illustrator Yoshitaka Amano, whose unique and eccentric artwork has set the tone for Final Fantasy since the very beginning. But one of the most underrated contributors to the Final Fantasy franchise is the pixel genius who made it all come alive on the screen. Katsuko Shibuya was the mind behind the character sprites going all the way back to the original Final Fantasy, where she gave form to iconic pixel heroes such as the Black Mage and Red Mage. For Final Fantasy VI, she was once again responsible for translating Amano's vibrant concept art into pixel-perfect sprites, rendering the game's cast of heroes and villains in beautiful 16-bit graphics. And this time, she outdid herself. With higher resolution and more detail to work with, Shibuya poured her efforts into fleshing out the characters by drawing them in all sorts of different poses and animations. Each hero got their own unique look for casting a spell or preparing to strike, which helped them stand out from each other visually. The characters had a greater range of expression than ever before, which made story scenes more visually engaging. And this change benefited some characters more than others. The flamboyant insanity of the game's villain Kefka was brilliantly conveyed through the custom animations Shibuya lovingly prepared for him. Perhaps the most important change to the way the game portrayed its characters came in the form of their proportions. For the first time, Final Fantasy VI's heroes were the same size both in and out of battle, which meant that all those poses and animations Shibuya prepared could be used in any context, including cutscenes. A character's near-death pose from combat could express shock or despair. The attack stance could show anger or determination and Sabin's victory pose served just as well for a feat of great athleticism as he leapt from car to car on the Phantom Train. When it came time to hash out the game's most dramatic scenes, the event designers could draw from a wealth of different poses, and the team made clever use of these graphical assets, sometimes in ways even Shibuya herself did not expect. Upon seeing one of the game's most pivotal scenes for the first time, Shibuya was surprised. The pose Celis made as she plunged from a cliff was actually the one she designed for when the heroine takes damage in battle. This kind of thing was part and parcel in Final Fantasy VI's development. Throughout the process, the team pushed each other to reach greater and greater heights, and the results carried through in every aspect of the game. Not only was Final Fantasy VI's story better told than ever before, it was also a lot less predictable. Where most games of this era were built around a pretty simple gameplay loop, Final Fantasy VI would introduce unique mechanics for specific situations, sometimes abandoning them again right afterwards. And as strange as that might seem today, it made the experience feel exciting and luxurious. You never knew what might come next. After her ill-fated meeting with the mysterious Asper, Terra wakes up in the house of Arvis, a member of a resistance group called the Returners. And here's where the story really kicks off. In a lively series of twists and turns, we get an escape sequence that ends with Terra cornered in the depths of the mines, and a sepia-toned flashback that gives context to her character and introduces the game's villain before cutting to the treasure hunter Locke and recruiting a small army of adorable Moogles to protect Terra. Final Fantasy VI really kept you on your toes. In the span of the game's first half hour, you'd experienced three totally different modes of gameplay. Mowing down enemies as a squad of Magitek riding soldiers, fighting monsters alone as Terra, and duking it out with the guards of Narsh in a strategy battle using three teams of fighters. And once the game got started, it never really let up. By the time the game's first hour drew to an end, Locke and Terra had left Narsh for Figaro Castle, met up with King Edgar, ally of the Returners, and defied the Emperor's right-hand man, General Kefka. These scenes once again showcased the story's dynamic structure, 
where gameplay would switch freely between different characters to show multiple perspectives, and interrupt the narrative with flashbacks to fill in the past. And the sequence's big twist, the fact that Figaro Castle is a machine-powered submersible that burrows beneath the sand, was one of those iconic moments that proved an important point. In this story, literally anything at all could happen. Final Fantasy VI also improved on the best feature of Final Fantasy IV. Square's first Super Nintendo game introduced a cast of complex heroes who grew and changed throughout the story. But the sixth game took this concept to the next level. Final Fantasy VI really stepped it up when it came to dialogue, giving the heroes stronger personalities, conflicted thoughts, and believable motivations. Scenes like Terra's meeting with Edgar and her conversation with Locke while resting in the castle worked wonders to add depth and substance to the game's heroes, in spite of the technical limitations. And the game had many of these little scenes that served only to help us get to know the characters better. The writers often found clever ways to set the stage for these conversations. When Edgar and Locke talk about using Terra's magic to fight the Empire, the scene plays out with the three heroes on the backs of chocobos, giving the back and forth between them a vibrant and engaging energy. In the town of Zozo, the heroes plan their next move while descending the steps of a great tower. And the sequence where the returners prepare to defend Narsh against the forces of Kefka has different groups of characters weaving in and out of the scene at different times, and conflicts between individual heroes add tension and energy to the whole episode. But in spite of all its complex storytelling, Final Fantasy VI was actually faster paced than other games of its kind. The sequences were short and sweet, the content was varied and exciting, and the story was full of great surprises. And the most remarkable twist to the game's structure came fairly early, in the form of an unexpected choice. The first two or three hours of Final Fantasy VI play out in a straightforward manner, as the game sets the stage for the conflict ahead. We meet Terra, a magic-wielding slave of the Empire, and Locke, an agent of the Returners, who helps her escape. In Figaro Castle, they seek the advice of King Edgar, but when the homicidal maniac General Kefka and his Imperial soldiers show up looking for Terra, the trio are forced to make a narrow escape. Thinking that Terra's unique power could be the weapon their assistance needs to turn the tide against the Empire. Locke and Edgar decide to take her to see Bannon, the leader of the Returners. On Mount Colts, a martial artist named Vargas ambushes the heroes, and Edgar's twin brother Sabin comes to their rescue. For the first time in the game, you now have a full party of four characters. But if you were thinking that things would stay this way from now on, you were in for a rude awakening because all of that is about to change. The scenes at the Returner hideout are about as close as Final Fantasy VI ever gets to actual role-playing. When Terra meets Bannon, she is told that she might well be the world's last hope against the might of the Empire, and given a choice. Join the Returners and use her powers to fight for freedom, or leave them to their fate and seek her destiny elsewhere. And as Terra agonizes over the most difficult decision of her young life, she has the run of the Returner hideout. You can look for treasure, you can find out what the Returners are thinking, but most of all, you can talk to your companions, learn more about their past, and find out what motivates them. And armed with this knowledge, you can confront Bannon and give him your answer. Of course, you're not actually free to totally alter the outcome of the game's story at this point, and Terra's choice is mostly a formality. Instead, the most interesting thing about this sequence is what comes after. As the Returners make their plans to oppose the Empire, the story delivers its first major setback. The Empire has captured the town of South Figaro and now marches on the Returner hideout. Faced with an urgent need to act, the party splits in two. Locke rushes off to South Figaro to gather information about the Empire's movements, while Bannon accompanies the others in an attempt to reach Narsh, where they hope to use Terra's special gift to make contact with the frozen Esper from the beginning of the game. 
While escaping on a raft down the turbulent river, the party runs afoul of the odious Ultras, and after chasing off the tentacle deviant, Sabin leaps into the water to hunt him down and gets washed away. With the heroes separated into different groups, the stage was set for one of Final Fantasy VI's biggest innovations, the three scenarios. The moment one story branched into three was a monumental shift in JRPG history. Switching between different viewpoints and playing out individual scenarios with different characters evoked the feeling of an epic fantasy novel like The Lord of the Rings or The Wheel of Time. And even though the order you played the scenarios didn't matter in the long run, the fact that you got to pick in the first place had a huge impact on me as a kid. And the fork in the story worked wonders for the game's sense of pacing. Each of the three scenarios was a wildly different experience. Bannon's branch was over in minutes, while Sabin's story was by far the longest. Locke's quest had you infiltrating an occupied town to gather intel and rescue a prisoner, and if you'd already found some of South Figaro's secrets, you now had a chance to cash in on that familiarity. Or if you'd skimped out on exploring the town on your first time through, you now had a second chance to pilfer its treasures. But to my mind, the real star of the three scenarios has always been Sabin. His quest is the longest, the most elaborate and the most memorable. And a large part of the reason is because it holds the game's best dungeon. When you strip away the surface to look at the core mechanics, Final Fantasy VI's dungeons were still built the same way they were in the earlier games. But in actual practice, they were a totally different experience. Long, grueling dungeon crawls were a thing of the past, and most of the areas could now be beaten in under 30 minutes. Where Final Fantasy V provided the pinnacle of classic Final Fantasy dungeon design, the sixth game started to blur the line between dungeon and scenario. Ironically, the game's first few dungeons were some of its least creative. The Mines of Narsh, the South Figaro Cave, and Mount Colts all took place in familiar environments and played out in mostly traditional fashion. And perhaps Square wanted to ease the players into the game with something a bit more predictable. Because starting with the rafting expedition down Lethe River, things took a sudden turn for the unusual. Instead of the traditional maze to explore, the river presented an on-rails experience, a barrage of enemy encounters broken up only by the occasional choice of which branch of the river to take, and a couple of spots where you could catch your breath and save your game. And Lethe River was only the beginning. There's something like 25 different dungeons in Final Fantasy VI, and many of them were highly creative. The Opera House was part dungeon, part musical, complete with a race across the rafters to stop an evil octopus from dropping a weight onto the stage below. In the Imperial camp, you snuck your way past soldiers, eavesdropped on enemy generals and busted out using stolen magitic armor. And the city of Zozo was a dungeon in the form of a town, where the residents were your enemies, the streets were filled with random encounters, and even the shopkeepers couldn't be trusted. Never before had the dungeons of a Final Fantasy game featured so much variety in concept, environment, and even gameplay mechanics. And the best dungeon of them all is the one that came as the biggest surprise. Players entering the Phantom Forest for the first time would have prepared themselves for a standard woodland dungeon, even if this one was infested with ghosts. Instead, after only a few short screens spent trekking through the misty forest with its haunting music, the heroes stumbled across a mysterious train station and found themselves boarding a train. The Phantom Train was as much an experience as it was a dungeon. The core gameplay and the very idea of what a dungeon should be was subverted at every step of the way. The Phantom Train took the confined spaces of a train and turned it into a dungeon, where cabins, corridors, and rooftops became the spaces to explore. Besides the random encounters you had to endure, the train was full of wandering ghosts, and not all of them were hostile. Some would sell you items, and others could even be recruited into your party for a limited time. 
At one point, a crowd of ghosts cornered the heroes and forced them to leap across the roofs to escape. Elsewhere, ghostly waiters served the heroes dinner in the train's dining car. Nothing about the dungeon was predictable. And a big surprise still waited for you at the front of the train. The Phantom Train was an unforgettable experience, and a large part of the reason was the atmosphere it conveyed. The calm, eerie soundtrack combined with clever sound effects to sell the illusion of being trapped in a moving train haunted by ghosts. But as great as it all sounded, it looked even better. And it was all thanks to another one of Square's unsung heroes. As the last and most advanced of the 2D entries in the Final Fantasy series, supplying the game with appropriate visuals was a major undertaking. I already mentioned Katsuko Shibuya, who was the graphics director in charge of the characters, but Final Fantasy VI actually had four graphics directors, each responsible for a different part of the game's look. Two of the others have names that will be very familiar to most diehard JRPG fans, and their contributions to the game will be explained in due time. But the last and most criminally underappreciated of the four is the man who painted Final Fantasy VI's unique world in pixel-perfect fashion. When Final Fantasy VI shed the series' heavy emphasis on traditional fantasy in favor of a world in the throes of an industrial revolution, the shift in focus demanded a change in presentation. Hideo Minaba, who would later serve as the art director on Final Fantasy IX, was put in charge of the game's towns, dungeons, and other interiors. He took great care to make each location feel realistic in its own right, and to give the impression that people lived and worked in those fictional spaces. And the results were undeniably gorgeous. The coal mining town of Narsh set the tone for the new world, with its tightly stacked, multi-tier timber and brick houses draped over cliffs and terraces, with spinning wheels, churning furnaces, and smoke belching from chimneys combining to create an atmosphere of industry and drudgery. Figaro Castle, a combination of richly textured stonework and carefully rendered feats of complex engineering, stood as witness to the ingenuity of King Edgar's machinists. And the Phantom Forest was presented as a stunning diorama, with giant tree trunks rising in the foreground, misty woods for a backdrop, and the still, reflective waters of a woodland lake to perfect the illusion. But Minaba's greatest achievement was the Phantom Train itself. The interplay of light and shadow sketched the outline of doors and canopied roofs of the train's exterior. Bright golds and navy blues furnished the lush interiors, punctuated by maroon carpets on coarse-grained wood. And the scrolling forest that zipped by in the background as you crossed from car to car was a brilliant touch. The lavish trappings of a luxury train, coupled with the ghostly setting, made for an unforgettable environment. And even today, it still looks beautiful. The Phantom Train's immersive power was made even stronger by another of the game's graphical improvements. In the NES games, battles took place on an empty black void, with a simple banner stretched across the top to suggest the environment. With Final Fantasy IV, the series introduced battle scenes, colorful backdrops, to set the stage for combat. These got more detailed as the series went on, and Final Fantasy VI knocked them out of the park. The mist-shrouded trees and dappled sunlight of the woodland arena, the rich curtains and crowded seats of the opera stage, the brooding clouds above the endless plain of the veldt, many of the backgrounds were absolutely gorgeous, and some of them even featured animation, like the turbulent waters beneath the raft on Lethal River, or the shifting haze in the depths of the Serpent Trench. And the Phantom Train got an animated battleground of its own. When you fight on the train's exterior, the battle arena features the curved rooftop of a train car, set against the backdrop of a rapidly scrolling wall of trees. One last perfect little touch to complete the illusion. Gameplay, story, and presentation came together to create something magical in the Phantom Train. 
It's the kind of experience that brings people together through the memories we share of fond moments. And of course, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't talk about Final Fantasy VI's most famous meme. For Japanese fans who'd gotten the chance to experience Final Fantasy V, starting up the sequel for the first time might have been a bit of a disappointment, because Final Fantasy VI was missing the previous game's best feature, the job system. Final Fantasy V's heroes could switch between different jobs as you went through the game, changing abilities on the fly to adapt to different situations. But this feature was removed from Final Fantasy VI, or so it would seem, because I would argue that the job system is still there, it's just been cleverly hidden. Just like in Final Fantasy IV, each of Final Fantasy VI's heroes was assigned a job of their own. Sion is a samurai. Setzer is a gambler and Celis is a rune knight. Although ironically, these titles were removed from the North American version of the game's menu. Different characters are stronger, faster or better at using magic than others. And each character is also restricted in what weapons and armor they're allowed to equip. More importantly, the heroes all got their own unique ability to go with their job. Locke, an adventurer, can steal items from monsters. Edgar, a machinist, has the tools command, which gives him access to a variety of powerful mechanical weapons you find as treasure throughout the game. And Strago, a blue mage, can learn the magic of monsters and use it against them. But even though the characters all had their own strengths and weaknesses, that didn't mean you had less customization options than in the previous game. Final Fantasy VI introduced relics. These were items you equip that grant the character a special perk. Some are simple benefits, like the star pendant's immunity to poison. Others are unique abilities or new options. The sprint shoes increase your run speed in towns and dungeons, the Genji glove lets you wield two weapons at the same time, and the Dragoon boots give access to the jump command in battle. Up to two relics can be equipped by each character at the same time, and they're basically how you customize the hero's capabilities. But what if I told you the relic system is actually Final Fantasy V's ability system in disguise? In the fifth game, a hero who spent enough time in a certain job would master permanent abilities that could be equipped on other jobs, letting you mix and match to make your perfect team. Final Fantasy VI took this idea, but attached each ability to a piece of equipment. Any character could equip any relic as long as you could find the item, and relics could be freely traded back and forth between heroes, which meant you no longer had to grind for abilities before you could use them. The Relic System's modular approach to character customization was the perfect fit for Final Fantasy VI. It offered a ton of freedom without giving up what made the characters unique. Great characters are defined by what they do, and the role a character plays is often what makes them stick out in our minds. Science a soft-spoken middle-aged gentleman, but the heavens tremble when he draws his katana. Celis can dazzle the crowds with her voice and her beauty, but she's also a sharp-witted, magic-wielding sword fighter. And Edgar is a fast-talking, womanizing rebel king. But what truly defines him is that he's the kind of deranged maniac who would bring a bag of power tools to a sword fight. But the character that stuck out the most in the minds of fans for all these years is probably Sabin. Edgar's twin brother is a monk but he's more like a gym bro than a cloistered martial artist. And this bro most certainly lifts. Sabin's special ability is Blitz, which lets you input fighting game style button combinations to unleash special moves. Aurobolt fires a Hadouken-like beam of energy at the enemy. Fire Dance washes the monsters in purifying fire. And Suplex lets Sabin lift his foe into the sky and slam it back down in spine-crunching fashion. Which leads us back to the Phantom Train. Because at the end of the dungeon, to stop the train from speeding them right into the afterlife along with its ghostly passengers, Sabin and Sion must fight the demonic engine itself. The devs could have made the Phantom Train immune to Suplex, but they didn't. 
they decided to give Sabin his moment. And in that moment, Sabin became a legend, forever immortalized in the minds of Final Fantasy fans as the guy who could suplex a freaking train engine. Sabin's Blitz was one of many innovative new mechanics in Final Fantasy VI, but the game's most creative ability was the one possessed by another character, the one that had a whole part of the world dedicated to it. Some of the abilities given to Final Fantasy VI's heroes were familiar favorites from the earlier games. Locke got the Thieves Steel command, Shadow inherited the ninja's ability to throw weapons in combat, and Strago took over blue magic in the form of his lore. But the game also introduced a host of new and interesting powers. Mog's Dance command put a new spin on the Geomancer's terrain ability, which unleashed a random effect tied to the current terrain. This time, the Dancing Moogle could transform the battlefield to any terrain type he'd previously fought in, but once he started dancing, he couldn't stop until the fight was over. Setzer's unique talent combined luck and timing through a system of spinning slots that could trigger some insanely powerful effects if you line them up just right. But my favorite ability back in the day was Science Sword Tech, which gave him access to a savage set of katana skills. The only catch was you had to be patient. Instead of a menu, Sword Tech used a numbered gauge that filled up as you waited with powerful abilities needing more time to charge. But if Sword Tech took patience to use, then mastering another of the game's new abilities took serious dedication. After being washed downriver during the fight with Ultras, Sabin finds himself separated from his friends. With the aid of a traveling mercenary named Shadow, he infiltrates an Imperial camp, where they uncover a plot by General Kefka to poison the people of Doma. Unable to stop the villain's heinous act, Sabin and Shadow join forces with Sion, a knight of Doma who lost his wife and son to Kefka's poison. And together, the three escape the Imperial camp and make their way towards Narsh to join up with the Returners. On the way, they pass through the Phantom Forest, where they accidentally board the Phantom Train that carries the souls of the dead to the afterlife. After beating some sense into the train's demonic engine, Sion says a last emotional farewell to his wife and son, before the heroes depart the forest. Shadow leaves the party as they reach Baron Falls, but Sabin and Sion decide to push on. Taking a leap of faith, the two heroes wash up on the vast plain of the Velt, a barren wilderness home to savage monsters. Which is where they meet Gao. Final Fantasy V introduced the popular Blue Magic system, where the character could learn the abilities of monsters by interacting with them in combat. Final Fantasy VI went one step further with Gao, a wild kid who runs with monsters to learn their ways. Gao doesn't have a fight command. Instead, he relies on rage, which allows him to emulate any monster he's familiar with. After you select an enemy from the list, Gao enters a berserk state, taking on the chosen monster's traits and mimicking its fighting style until the battle ends. To add new beasties to his repertoire, Gao has to spend time on the Velt. This special region of the world is stocked with almost every kind of monster the heroes have encountered so far on their journey, including some of the bosses. By tracking down a specific monster and using the Leap ability, you can send Gao off to live with the beasts. Fight another couple of battles on the Velt, and he'll show back up having learned how to fight like the monsters you left him with. With over 250 potential fighting styles for Gao to master, the Rage mechanic is easily one of the most versatile abilities in Final Fantasy history but it also highlights the freewheeling nature of Final Fantasy VI's design. The game had lots of clever ideas, but the way they were implemented wasn't always the best. Celis' runic ability can be incredibly useful in certain fights, but it sucks up the spells of friends and foes alike, and it's usually smarter to just attack. Cyan's sword tech is super cool, but staring at the screen while you charge up his more powerful moves is not all that fun. 
And as powerful as Gauss rages can be, the only way to pick up new ones is to stop what you're doing, travel back to the Velt, and grind random encounters. By modern standards, the game's design was kind of a mess, but none of this bothered me back in the day. Because Final Fantasy VI was never really about streamlined systems and fine-tuned balance. It was about playing around with the toys you were given and finding ways to break the game. In terms of difficulty and strategic depth, Final Fantasy VI can be seen as a step back from the previous title, and fighting can get kind of repetitive. Almost every battle can be won just by spamming your favorite attacks. Only a couple of bosses force you to think on your feet, and outside of a handful of dungeons, you rarely have to change up your tactics. The game is full of questionable design choices, and the balance is all over the place. Edgar's autocrossbow is ridiculously good in the first few hours, but only the chainsaw and drill stay useful throughout the game. There's a ton of spells you'll probably never use, and most of the espers you summon in battle are incredibly underwhelming. Some setups are hilariously overpowered. Combining the gem box with the economizer lets the hero cast the game's most powerful spells twice in the same round at almost no cost. Optimizing Sabin's magic stat turns his blitzes into devastating calamities. And the infamous Wind God Gao build weaponizes an unintended combination of combat effects to turn a mid-range character into an unstoppable monster. The original version of Final Fantasy VI also had its fair share of bugs. Some of them are game-breaking. Using Realm's sketch ability on an invisible enemy can pretty much destroy your whole life. Others are unfortunate, but hardly the end of the world, like the fact that the physical evasion stat does nothing, due to a coding snafu that checks magic evasion for both physical and magical attacks. And a few bugs are actually really fun, like how invisible enemies become vulnerable to instant death magic, making a simple 1-2 combo of spells powerful enough to wreck the whole game. Or the infamous Psycho Cyan bug, that turns the kind-hearted samurai into a merciless green death machine that won't stop attacking until everything's dead. But deep tactical combat was never really the point of Final Fantasy VI. Random encounters weren't really meant to be fun, but rather a source of tension. They're there to raise the stakes, drain your resources, and force you to make smart moves. The real battle is fought in the menus, and the steps you take to prepare for the next fight. What was fun was playing around with the game's, for its time, incredibly deep character customization. Final Fantasy VI might have had less strategic depth than Final Fantasy V, but it certainly had more complexity. And it's precisely that complexity that made it exploitable. With so much stuff to work with, it's no wonder a lot of it turned out to be broken. Final Fantasy VI gave you the freedom to get overpowered. Some of the most fun I've ever had with this game came from power leveling its heroes to stupid proportions. Speedrunning magic mastery by killing cactrots and hoovers in the desert outside of Miranda. Sending characters into the dinosaur forest one by one to maximize their growth. Slapping the Genji glove and the offering on the same hero to let them strike eight times in a single round. And sure, the Vanish and Doom combo was obviously game-breaking, but I'm still a bit salty about Square patching it out of later versions of the game. Come on, it's not a bug, guys. It's a feature. These days, massive JRPGs with hundreds of hours of playtime to offer are par for the course. But in 1994, Final Fantasy VI felt too good to be true. So what if only a handful of spells were all you needed to beat the game, when there was another 50 to experiment with? Who cared if a lot of the abilities were inferior, when a long list of rages, lures, dances, sword techniques, and blitzes were waiting to be learned? And did it really matter that the bosses were easy, when you got to figure out a thousand ways to crush each one? And when you hadn't seen anything like it ever before, Final Fantasy VI looked like a treasure chest of experiences, an infinite sandbox of endless adventure. 
and I'd pay good money to get to have that same feeling all over again for the first time. A big part of the reason why Final Fantasy VI had so much content on offer was due to its cast. The game had more heroes to play with than ever before. Because pretty much every aspect of Final Fantasy VI was designed around a central concept. And it had to do with the game's protagonist. Terra, Locke, Edgar, Sabin. Celis, Shadow, Cyan, Gao. Setzer, Strago, Realm, Mog, Umaro, and Gogo. With 14 playable characters, Final Fantasy VI has the largest cast in series history. But what really sets the heroes apart is the equal share they have in the game's story. Final Fantasy VI was developed using an iterative approach, and at the time development began, many of the most important details were still undecided. But one central theme was set in stone right from the start. Rather than build a narrative around a single main character, Final Fantasy VI would let the players decide. This would be a story where every character could be called the protagonist. To ensure the game's many characters would get equal attention, the task of realizing the ensemble cast was split between different team members. Yoshinori Kitase, who was given the role of overall director of the game's story, was responsible for the creation of Celis and Gao. Sakaguchi himself took charge of Terra and Locke. Kaori Tanaka, better known as Soraya Saga, co-writer of Sinogears and Sinosaga, dreamed up the brothers Edgar and Sabin. And another of the game's graphics directors, Tetsuya Nomura, one game away from achieving worldwide fame for his cutting-edge character designs, repurposed a couple of job ideas that hadn't made the cut during development of Final Fantasy V. A ninja with a dog and a gambler who fought with dice and cards, and turned them into Shadow and Setzer. With the team sharing the duties of detailing the game's characters, each contributor was able to pour more of their heart and soul into the individual heroes. To add definition to Edgar and Sabin, Tanaka outlined a whole elaborate backstory for the royal brothers. And although only a fraction of this material made it into the actual game, these hidden depths informed the characters and made them feel well-rounded and more real. Kitase also played a key role in realizing the game's villain. Rather than being planned in detail ahead of time, many of the story scenes were born from inspiration in the heat of the moment. For the scene where Kefka first appears at Figaro Castle, Kitase felt the interaction would be kind of boring if it played out as you might expect, with a stern imperial general delivering a warning to the young king. To spice things up, Kitase struck upon the idea to have Kefka command his men to dust the sand off his boots, even though he's in the middle of the desert, suggesting that the character might have a few loose screws. This spur-of-the-moment characterization ended up being the perfect fit, gradually transforming Kefka from the straightforward bad guy from the original script into the unforgettable insane clown in the final product. Some of the character concepts saw drastic changes over time. Terra started out not as a young woman, but as a somewhat older man. Locke was originally meant to start the game as Terra's friend and rival, and the runic ability was supposed to be his special power. And Celis began development as an Imperial double agent, who would pretend to ally with the heroes while planning to betray them, but ended up being swayed by Locke's kindness and care, and falling in love. And although this plotline was mostly dropped, traces of it can be clearly seen in the game's story. The concept of every character is the protagonist was so important. Some parts of the story were specifically written to preserve the balance between characters. Because much of the early game focused on Terra, the team decided to start the game's second half from the perspective of Celis. But their efforts were far from flawless. Cyan sees some amazing character development in optional side quests, but he barely features in the main story after you make it back to Narsh. Gao, Strago, and Realm could probably be removed from the game without breaking the story. And as his passion for his favorite character grew ever higher, Kitase admits 
to getting a bit carried away in giving Celis a larger and larger role. But even so, the game's ensemble cast ended up paying off, and splitting the heroes up into three scenarios was the perfect way to drive home the idea of a game without a clear-cut protagonist. But the true potential of the ensemble cast only became clear when the heroes got back together. As the three scenarios draw to an end, the Returners converge on the town of Narsh. Sabin, Cyan and Gao leave the Velt through the Serpent Trench, then catch a ship from the port city of Nikea. Locke finishes his fact-finding mission in South Figaro by liberating Celis, a disgraced Imperial general held captive by her own soldiers, and together they escape the occupied town. Bannon, Edgar and Terra follow the river to reach Narsh. The hero's reunion is heartfelt, but their relief is short-lived. General Kefka marches on Narsh with an army to capture the frozen Esper. With the survival of the resistance on the line, the returners rally the people of Narsh and make a stand in the mountains above town. One of the more surprising mechanics Final Fantasy VI introduced into the series was the idea of real-time strategy battles. Twice in the game, you're asked to separate the heroes into three teams that move independently about the field, guarding a stationary NPC from streams of enemy soldiers. The first time was near the start of the game, when Mog and his companions work with Locke to defend Terra. But this initial clash was more like a tutorial to the strategy battle concept than any real challenge. The second time was here, during the battle for the Frozen Esper, and with a total of seven playable characters gathered in one place for the first time, the stage was set for an epic battle. The strategy battles were a clever twist on the game's core mechanics that provided a welcome break from the usual dungeon crawling. You could move your parties around the area, use the game's menus and take up defensive positions. Instead of random encounters, enemies were visible on the screen and moved in real time, making their way through a twisting maze of passages towards the top. If an enemy were to slip through your grasp and reach Bannon, you'd lose. But if they met up with one of your parties, the fight was on. To win, you'd have to get to the enemy commander, General Kefka, and defeat him in battle. But there were many ways to reach that goal. The pre-battle lineup screen put your familiarity with the game's heroes to the test. Which characters go well together? Do you prefer balanced parties, or do you stack one team with all your favorites? And once you're on the field, do you hang back and let the bad guys come to you, systematically hunt the enemies down using a single super team, or speedrun the fight and go straight for the boss? The battle for the Frozen Esper also gave you the chance for the first time in the game to mix and match the seven heroes. You could find out how they worked together, learn how to use them in different situations, and see what you liked. And that's a really good thing, because the game was about to ask you to put those preferences into practice. After a savage battle in the mountains above Narsh, the returners drive Kefka back, preventing the frozen Esper from falling into enemy hands. But the hero's victory proves short-lived. When Terra reaches out to the Esper in the ice, a strange power erupts inside her. In a cascade of wild magic, Terra transforms into a glowing ethereal figure and goes berserk. With an otherworldly howl of rage and confusion, Terra lifts into the air, and before the heroes can recover, she disappears into the sky. In the aftermath, the heroes regroup, and the search for Terra is on. And here, we come to a major milestone in the Final Fantasy franchise. Because this moment is the first time in the whole series you finally get to form your own party. From this point on in the game, outside of some specific scenarios that force certain characters into the limelight, you have full control over who to bring along at any given time. And once you get the airship, you can change your mind pretty much at will. Final Fantasy VI took the companion system from Final Fantasy II and IV and blew it wide open. 
Not only could you choose who would be in your party for most of the game, but each new companion recruited to your cause expanded your options. But of course, this design choice came with some significant consequences to the game's story. By giving the player the freedom of choice, Final Fantasy VI's story had to get more dynamic. Because for the first time in the series, the game couldn't know which characters would be there for each scene. And some of the game's best moments are the ones you might not see. Certain scenes are only available if you bring the right characters to the right place at the right time. An optional stop in the search for Terra is the town of Kolingen, and it can be a rewarding detour if you bring the right people. Because Kolingen is Locke's hometown, and bringing him around some of the sites will trigger a set of pretty elaborate flashbacks that explain Locke's tragic past and give you a hint of his present motivations. And if you've got Celis in the party as well, you'll get a bit of an extra reaction from her. Final Fantasy VI is full of such optional story beats, some a lot more obscure than others. There's a long, intricate cutscene devoted to reuniting Gao with his estranged father, which will play out slightly differently depending on which characters you bring. Staying at inns with Shadow in your party has a chance to trigger one of a series of cryptic and somewhat creepy dreams that subtly and powerfully explain Shadow's backstory and his connection to Realm. There's even an optional scene near the start of the game that's so obscure only the most dedicated players would ever find it. If you backtrack all the way to South Figaro after defeating Vargas on Mount Colts, you can bring Sabin to see Vargas's mother and get a unique conversation. It's hardly worth the effort, but it's there, and it kind of blows my mind. But the most iconic, missable scene in Final Fantasy VI is the one that most players will end up finding. And ironically, it's probably the best bit of story in the whole game. Your first stop in the search for Terra is Figaro Castle. And if you happen to have both Sabin and Edgar in your party when you get there, you'll trigger a reaction. At night, Edgar and Sabin reminisce about the past, giving us a glimpse of the richly detailed backstory Kaori Tanaka infused into her creations. It all leads up to a deeply moving, emotional crescendo. The moment two brothers settle their futures on the toss of a coin. Neither brother wants the crown but someone has to take it, so they let fate decide. It's one of Final Fantasy's most touching moments, and it never fails to stir my emotions. But the true beauty of the scene only becomes apparent on a replay when you understand the true meaning of Edgar's actions. The scene where the heroes recruit the airship captain Setzer has several variations, all depending on who's around. Sellys and Locke are always there, but the other two are up to you. To trick Setzer into joining the heroes, Sellys uses a two-headed coin with identical signs, and if you brought Edgar along, she gets this coin from him. And if Sabin is there, he finally learns the truth about that fateful night atop the tower of Figaro Castle. Because Edgar didn't wager their futures on the toss of a coin. He fixed the game and stacked the odds to set his brother free, and Sabin never even knew his brother's sacrifice. This variation on the Setzer scene is so good you'd be forgiven for thinking it's mandatory. But it's entirely possible you'd never see it, and that's kind of the point of Final Fantasy VI's ensemble cast. By putting the power in your hands, the game also gave you the freedom to miss some of the best stuff. And for better or worse, that's something very few modern games would ever dare to do. But this design philosophy could also backfire. The coin toss scene is a pretty easy find. You're bound to bring the two brothers to Figaro Castle at some point in the game. But other scenes are much more elusive, and one of the hardest to trigger also happens to be some of the best development one of the heroes ever gets. For a brief window of time, after the banquet at Vector, but before you travel to Tamasa, there's a hidden scene waiting to be found. 
If you backtrack to the grounded blackjack and make your way to the engine room, you'll be treated to a conversation between Setzer and Sid that goes a long way towards fleshing out Setzer's character and motivations. It's the kind of content the game should have pushed harder, and the fact that most players never got to see it is really a shame. Final Fantasy VI's variable narrative was an incredible achievement. But whenever you're trying something for the very first time, you're bound to hit a few snags. And the game's implementation of party freedom was far from perfect. Final Fantasy IV, the first of the second era of Final Fantasy games, made fixed character identity a critical part of the story. The game took away a lot of the player's freedom, and some fans felt at the time that it strayed too far from the ethos of the earlier titles. But this lack of variation also made the game's narrative a lot more powerful. Final Fantasy VI took the same idea of fixed character identity and tried to do it better. And in many ways, the game knocked it out of the park. But by reintroducing player freedom, the game also had to deal with some unfortunate consequences. And the way the game handled them wasn't always the best. After the battle at Narsh, the heroes follow the trail of Terra to the remote town of Zozo, a treacherous den of thieves and murderers. There, they find their missing companion, unconscious and in the care of a strange old man. But Terra's caretaker is no ordinary Samaritan, but the Esper Ramu, an ancient creature of magic that's been hiding among humans since escaping the Empire. And he's about to charge the heroes with a critical mission. Up until the battle for Narsh, the game's scenarios had all featured a fixed cast. But the meeting with Ramu is the first significant plot point since the game gave you the freedom to pick your own party. Because the writers couldn't know which characters would be there to see it, they had to adjust the way the scene was written. And even though I never noticed it back in the day, in hindsight, it's plain to see they struggled to do so. The meeting with Ramu has a real proof-of-concept energy to it. The party members are assigned anonymous lines, seemingly at random. The dialogue sounds like bullet points from a PowerPoint slide, and there's only a handful of small variations depending on who you bring. It all reads more like a rough first draft than a finished product. And ironically, the very next scene kind of proves my point. Where the meeting with Ramu is stiff and unengaging, the conversation on the staircase that follows right after is one of the story's absolute highlights. The full cast reunite to frame this scene, and it's infinitely more powerful for it. And it's not like the writers didn't know. Final Fantasy VI's most important scenes tend to be written around specific characters, and the game could get pretty heavy-handed in how it made sure they'd be there. Sellies and Locke are shoehorned into the group that leaves Zozo to find passage to the southern continent, because the story needs them to be there for the next big event. Later, Terra and Locke are sent alone on a critical mission to Tamasa, because the game has to make space for Strago and Realm. And when the heroes prepare their assault on the floating continent, you're told to bring three characters, without so much as a word of explanation, just so that Shadow can squeeze into your party when you reach the dungeon. But as frustrating as these restrictions could feel, they also brought power to the story's best moments. Final Fantasy VI is known as the game with an ensemble cast and a ton of player freedom, but the game is at its best in the character-driven moments, where you don't have a choice. Sabin's scenario, the opera sequence, and the Tamasa arc are not just great little adventures, they're intimate pieces of an even greater anthology. Freedom of choice was a big part of Final Fantasy VI's draw, even if the narrative sometimes suffered for it. And one of the ways the game offered more freedom than ever before was in how it handled magic. Final Fantasy VI's Relics put a new spin on the now-familiar job system and introduced a wealth of options for the game's heroes. But the relic system was only one half of the game's new suite of character customization, and the other half was even more creative. A constant in the early Final Fantasy games were the classes of magic. White, 
black and later gray magic were all tied to different jobs. Black mages cast black magic, white mages white magic, and so on. And although some jobs straddled the line, like the paladin or the red mage, the game still made a clear distinction between jobs that wielded magic and those that didn't. But that all changed with Final Fantasy VI, even if it's not obvious from the first moments. In the early part of the story, Final Fantasy VI makes a big deal out of Terra's affinity for magic. We later learn that Celis can also cast spells, but for a decent while, it seems they're the only ones. But then you get to Zozo and learn about Magicite. In Zozo, the Esper Ramu explains that Emperor Gestal has been capturing his people and draining their essence to power his Magitek creations. Even now, many of his fellow espers are being held in the Imperial Magitek Research Facility, waiting to be sucked dry by Gestal's depraved scientists. As a child of an esper and a human, Terra is naturally able to use magic, while Celis, an Imperial Magitek Knight, had her cells infused with magical power extracted from espers. But what the Empire doesn't know is that the true power of the Espers can only be granted in the form of Magicite, magical stones that contain the sum total of an Esper's essence. Ramu then charges the heroes with rescuing his kin from the Magitek research facility, and sacrifices his life to turn into Magicite to empower the heroes in their quest. The introduction of Magicite is a total game changer, Magic, once the domain of Terra and Celis alone, is now available to every character. By equipping Magicite like Shiva, Ifrit, and Ramu, a hero can summon the dead Esper's power in battle. But that's the least of the benefits the stones can give. Because each Magicite also holds a set of spells it can impart to the bearer of the stone. In a system reminiscent of Final Fantasy II, every character can learn every spell, and the one so critical distinction between white and black magic is a thing of the past. To master a spell, all you need is the right magicite and a bit of patience. From this point forward, defeating monsters in battle earns you magic points, which allow the characters to learn new spells from equipped magicites. Different espers grant different spells, and some espers even teach certain magics at faster rates. And while the Magicite themselves can be traded back and forth between different heroes, the spells the characters learn remain forever. Magicite and magic points made battles more exciting. Learning new spells was something to look forward to, and watching the percentages tick up with each fight was immensely satisfying. But the Magicite system was also a brilliant way to integrate story into gameplay mechanics. In the world of Final Fantasy VI, magic was incredibly powerful, so the fact that a lot of the sheer power of your party came from espers made total sense. Where the early games had strong separations between story and gameplay, Final Fantasy VI blurred the line to provide a unique experience. Story, character, gameplay, and presentation. The game's different aspects combined to form a whole that was greater than the sum of its parts. And that's especially true of the game's most iconic sequence. Final Fantasy VI was more like a cinematic experience than any previous JRPG, and significant story beats were lifted to greater heights by impressive visuals and stirring music. As the heroes approach the Imperial capital, the Emperor's palace looms above the horizon like a testament to the Empire's might. A pyramid of steel and stone bathed in artificial light. When the Emperor raises the floating continent into the sky, we see the massive landmass ripping free from the Earth from the perspective of the people below. And the breaking of the world after Kefka disturbs the balance of the Warring Triad is one of the most extraordinary cutscenes produced for the Super Nintendo. But the game's commitment to providing an immersive experience is best illustrated by its most ambitious scene. To free the captive espers from the Empire's grasp, the Returners must reach the Imperial capital of Vector. 
But getting to the southern continent is no easy task. The heroes need an airship, and there is only one man in the world who can provide it. The infamous gambler Setzer Gabiani. Learning that Setzer has his sights set on the celebrated opera singer Maria, the heroes concoct a daring plan. Celis, who happens to be the spitting image of Maria, will take her place on the stage. There's no doubt that the opera scene is Final Fantasy VI's most famous feature. But this lavish story sequence began as nothing but a single line in Sakaguchi's script, an event to be held at the opera. Yoshinori Kitase felt that this idea, rough as it was, had the potential to become something truly unforgettable. Working together with composer Nobuo Uematsu and graphics director Hideo Minaba, Kitase drew on his love of the cinema, taking inspiration from Alfred Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much to create an engaging, entertaining, wild ride of a story sequence which was, at the time, by far the most elaborate set-piece scenario ever seen in a JRPG. Minaba's artwork drew you in with its richly detailed theater, an animated orchestra, and the use of light and shadow to build an atmosphere. Uematsu surpassed himself to compose an operatic suite of music with a total of four tracks, including Aria di Mezzo Caratere, which featured primitive synthesized vocals to go along with the melody. Like the character of Celis, a former imperial general who has to play the part of Maria, a famous opera singer, Uematsu and Kitase also had to fake it. Kitase had never been to the opera, and Uematsu knew nothing about composing operatic music. But both drew on vast stores of creative energy to produce something that felt, at the time, utterly convincing. The opera scene was mournful beautiful and sometimes hilarious. And above all, it sold the illusion. The beautifully drawn balcony with its curtains transported us into the audience. The digital chirps of the Super Nintendo sound chip became orchestral in our heads, the lyrics on the screen sounding clear in our minds. And like Setzer himself, we found ourselves drawn into the plot, forgetting for a moment that we were playing a video game. The opera scene probably looks like caveman paintings to modern audiences, but at the time, it was so far out of the expectation, so far beyond what was thought possible within the genre, it left me in a state of shock. And that first brutal impression never really went away. In 2022, I was fortunate enough to hear Aria di Mezzo Caratere performed live at Distant Worlds and the experience moved me to tears. But as amazing as it was to hear the music played by a full orchestra, the vocals performed by professional singers, the crazy thing is this. It all sounded exactly like this in my head back in 1994. When we talk about video games, we often try to decompose them into story and gameplay. But video games are interactive media, and the narrative elements cannot be easily separated from the rest of the product. They're woven into the very fabric of the game itself. And what we should really be talking about is the overall experience of playing the game. Final Fantasy VI's opera scene is one of those moments in gaming history that proved this point. It's not exactly a cutscene and not exactly a dungeon. It's a bit of both. But above all, it was an unforgettable experience. And the same can be said for another of Final Fantasy VI's breathtaking moments. When it came to visual presentation, Final Fantasy VI improved on pretty much every aspect from the previous titles. The heroes had a fresh new look, towns and dungeons were better detailed and more immersive, and spell effects got more elaborate than ever before. But one area that looked especially impressive back in the day is the one that has aged the most poorly. 
having baited their trap at the opera, the returners lure in Setzer and confront him on his own airship. There, through trickery and tenacity, the heroes convince their reluctant gambler to lend them his aid, and are granted the use of his airship, the Blackjack. Setzer's Blackjack was by far the most impressive aircraft the series had seen at this point. With its multi-screen interior of beautifully detailed cabins including an integrated casino floor, and with your companions staking out their favorite spots around the ship, the Blackjack was a marvel to explore, even before you'd gotten off the ground. But it was even better when you took to the skies. While Final Fantasy V's world map had reused most of the graphical assets from the previous game, Final Fantasy VI's world map got a completely new look, courtesy of the game's fourth and final graphics director, Tetsuya Takahashi. Takahashi, the future creator of the Xeno franchise and founder of Monolith Soft, gave the new world a full graphical overhaul. But more importantly, he also chose to present it in a totally different way. The fairy tale concept of a flying ship had taken Japan by storm in the 80s, thanks to Hayao Miyazaki's hugely popular animations like Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind and Laputa Castle in the Sky, and it especially captivated the team behind Final Fantasy. Airships had been a staple of the series going all the way back to the first game, but the NES's flat 2D presentation couldn't capture the feeling of hurtling through the sky at breakneck speed. Final Fantasy IV and V had experimented with the Super Nintendo's famous Mode 7 feature, which allowed for the stretching and scaling of 2D sprites to achieve a quasi-3D view, but their efforts only really struck gold with Final Fantasy VI. By tilting the map the heroes explored, the game gave the impression of depth and scale. Hopping on the back of a chocobo transformed the scene into a third-person view, tracking the rider from behind as you faced the horizon. And when you lifted into the sky in the blackjack, the effect got even stronger. Flying in Final Fantasy VI was an absolute blast. The ability to move in any direction gave an unmatched feeling of freedom. Watching the world zip by below as you charged towards the horizon was thrilling. And seeing the bright blue skies of the world of balance, or the scarlet and orange clouds of the world of ruins sunset of destruction, completed your transportation into a fantasy realm in need of saving. Finally, Square felt they had achieved what they set out to do, when they first introduced airships into the Final Fantasy series. Today, Mode 7 looks extremely dated, and out of all the aspects of Final Fantasy VI's visuals, the design of the world map has aged the worst. But way back then, it felt like a great leap forward, and the new way of experiencing flight looked cutting edge. Still, don't get me wrong, I call Final Fantasy VI a masterpiece, but even for its time, it wasn't a perfect achievement. It had flaws and shortcomings. And even though we didn't realize it at the time, one of those problems was something specific to the North American version of the game. But in some ways, even that turned out to be a blessing in disguise. After reaching the southern continent, the Returners infiltrate the imperial capital of Vector, and forced their way into the imposing Magitic Research Facility. But just as the heroes free the captive espers, they're hit with a shocking revelation. Or rather, they would be, if the translation hadn't gotten it all wrong. In the heart of the Magitic Research Facility, the heroes run into Sid, the inventor of Magitic, and the closest thing to family that Sully's has. Surprised to see her back at home, Sid asks Sellys a strange question. Did you come here to cause an uprising? And for some weird reason, Locke loses his mind. But that's not at all what Sid was meant to say. What the original Japanese Sid should actually be asking is this. Is it true you infiltrated the rebel group as a spy? This reading puts the situation in a totally different light and certainly explains Locke's reaction. Final Fantasy VI has this whole elaborate plotline about the possibility of Celis being a spy for the Empire, 
But because of mistakes like the one we just saw, this whole story falls super flat. And it's far from the only mistranslation that made it into the North American version. The scene where the heroes discovered the idols of the Warring Triad was supposed to give some much needed clarity about the War of the Magi. But an absolute mess of misunderstandings and mixed up terminology means you're likely to come away with completely the wrong impression. There's also a ton of smaller blunders sprinkled throughout the game. A scholar in Albrook gives some really bad advice about the monsters on the southern continent. A man in Zozo who's supposed to be lying to the heroes tells them the truth instead. And a mistranslation changes Setzer's whole motivation for helping the heroes, although arguably for the better. But it wasn't all bad. In some ways, the translation even made the game better. The most compelling idea from Final Fantasy VI was the concept of Magitech, the mad alchemy of metalwork and wizardry used by the Empire to manufacture magic-powered death machines and infuse ordinary people with sorcerous talents. But Magitech almost didn't exist, because the entire idea of Magitech was invented in the English translation. While Final Fantasy IV's North American localization had been carried out by internal staff who didn't even speak fluent English, for Final Fantasy VI, Square got professional help. The hero of the story is a man named Ted Woolsey, and he was given an almost impossible task. Most of the issues with the English translation can be traced back to the difficult circumstances of Woolsey's work. By the time he was brought on to do his job, Development was pretty much done. Woolsey was handed a copy of the game cartridge along with the source code and given 30 days to translate everything into English. The history of Woolsey's efforts with Final Fantasy VI and other Squaresoft games is a fascinating story that could fill an entire video. But the gist of it is this. Woolsey was given very little time to do an incredibly difficult job without any proper documentation or even support from the team and all of this before the internet was widely available. So it's no wonder Woolsey sometimes got stuff wrong. And it really speaks to his passion and skill as a translator that the final product was this much fun. Woolsey's English translation was clear, colloquial, and charming. And even if he had to take some liberties with the original text, the game we got was just as good as the Japanese version. And in some ways, it might have even been a little better. Woolsey's unique voice worked especially well for General Kefka, boosting a somewhat generic bad guy into an incredibly entertaining villain with some very memorable lines. Run, run, or you'll be well done. Remind me to show you my Magicite collection sometime. You might see a few familiar faces. And of course, Kefka's unforgettable boast before the final battle. I will create a monument to non-existence. Woolsey's Kefka was truly inspired. And it's often said that the character is more popular in the West than in Japan. But Woolsey's influence didn't stop at shaping the villain. He also invented one of Final Fantasy's most enduring concepts. In the Japanese version of Final Fantasy VI, the Empire's secret weapon is sorcery, and the elite soldiers who practice it are called wizards. And the mortal remains of espers, from which you draw your magic, are simply known as magic stones. It was Woolsey who transformed magic stones into magicite, fused sorcery and technology into magitech, and made Kefka and Selys magitech knights. And I couldn't imagine it any other way. Woolsey's translation was far from perfect, but he worked his butt off to get it done and helped deliver an amazing experience to a new audience. A game for kids, but one that took us seriously, because when it came to telling a memorable story, Final Fantasy VI did not pull its punches. Final Fantasy VI was a complex story with a lot of twists, but the least expected turn of them all was the one that seemed for a moment, to change everything. The moment where you suddenly had to wonder, where is this story actually going? The confrontation at the Magitech research facility represents a turning point in the game's narrative. 
the Returners strike a first decisive blow at the heart of the Empire, but Sully's is captured, and when the Espers they came to liberate sacrifice themselves to aid the heroes, the Empire learns the secret of Magicite. As the heroes regroup in the town of Zozo, Terra awakens from her comatose state in response to one of their recovered Magicite. She reveals that the Esper was her father, Maduin, and explains at last her tragic past. She was the product of the love between human and Esper, but 18 years ago, when Terra was still a baby, Emperor Gestal invaded the world of the Espers in a bid to revive the lost source of magic. The Espers drove him out, but not before he killed Terra's parents and stole her from her people. With the fate of the world hanging in the balance, the Returners make haste for the sealed gate to the land of the Espers, where Terra contacts her people. The Espers respond, surging forth in vast numbers and laying waste to the Empire. By the time the heroes return through the Imperial capital, the Emperor has called for a truce, Kefka is rotting in a prison cell and the war seems to be over. The peace conference at Vector was as much a shocking twist as it was a refreshing change of pace. Suddenly, instead of navigating dungeons and fighting monsters, you were chatting up guards at the Imperial Palace and trading diplomatic words with the Emperor over a formal banquet. The peace conference was an opportunity to see the villains in a new light, and a rare chance to contemplate the kind of moral dilemma most games of the time never once approached. Could the Emperor be forgiven for his crimes if it led to peace? And even though the Emperor's bid for peace would later turn out to be false, the banquet at Vector revealed the game's unique character. For all its comedic hijinks and goofy situations, Final Fantasy VI was no light-hearted fairy tale. We see cities under military occupation, women and children murdered by poison, a prisoner beaten by soldiers while chained to a wall, Kefka sucks the life out of espers and dumps their bodies like trash, Emperor Gestal stabs a woman and steals her baby. This is a story where the villain destroys the world and the heroine tries to take her own life. But it was also a story that showed that not all things were black and white. The Gestalian Empire was rotten, but many of its soldiers were horrified at Kefka's actions, and General Leo was a genuinely good man and the game also taught you not to take everything at face value. Kefka spends a lot of the game openly lying about Selys, about the Empire's intentions, and about his own desires. And Gestol puts on a whole peace conference and cries crocodile tears to trick the heroes into doing his dirty work. A story like Final Fantasy VI came at the perfect time. It was a darker, more adult story that really resonated with an audience of kids who had grown up with the NES and were starting to hit our teens. A story that didn't pull its punches and trusted young gamers to handle something a bit more mature than what we'd gotten before. When asked if the team had reservations about dealing with such mature themes as suicide and loss in a time when most other games were sticking to safer material, Yoshinori Kitase has later said, Back then, video games were not as widely recognized and were more or less perceived as children's entertainment. We had a strong desire to appeal to the public with sensational, mature themes. In hindsight, it was done in the rashness of youth. We may have been a bit more hesitant to do so in this day and age. To this, I can only say, thanks for standing up for us kids, Kitase-san. Final Fantasy VI was, for its time, incredibly ambitious. It was a labor of love in a world before patching a game was easily done, and the first version was also meant to be the final. The development team poured their hearts and souls into making Final Fantasy VI a great product, fighting the clock to include as much content as they possibly could. And as strange as it might sound, the game's best feature the one that defines Final Fantasy VI is something that wasn't even supposed to be in the game. One of the greatest strengths of Final Fantasy VI was the game's immaculate pacing. It never lingered very long on any one idea, and you were constantly thrown from one situation to the next, with no two dungeons, locations, 
or scenarios ever the same. One moment you were battling your way through an epic dungeon, the next you were seated at a banquet trying to negotiate a peace treaty, and before you knew it, you were off on a ship bound for an isolated island community. And just when it looked like peace was on the horizon, the heroes found themselves staring down the end of the world. At the peace conference, the unlikely allies plot a new course of action. Terra and Locke will travel to the remote town of Tamasa with Celis, General Leo and the mercenary Shadow to search for the espers who devastated Vector and seek an end to hostilities between the two species. With the help of an old man named Strago, a descendant of the long-lost Magi who can naturally use magic, the heroes locate the espers and arrange for a peace summit in Tamasa. But before negotiations can conclude, General Kefka crashes the party, revealing that the Emperor's peace talks were nothing but a ruse. Enraged by this treachery, General Leo turns on Kefka, but for all his power, he's no match for the insane Magitek Knight. Kefka murders General Leo, then unleashes his magic on the gathered espers, turning them all into magicite. With the way to the Esper world standing open, Emperor Gestal and Kefka use their newfound powers to steal through, seeking the source of all the world's magic, the Warring Triad, the three gods that once fought endlessly over world domination before turning themselves into stone to seal their own powers. As the Warring Triad awakens, the entire subcontinent rips free from the Earth's crust and soars into the sky. The floating continent, land of magic and cradle of infinite power. By the time you reached it, the floating continent felt like a worthy end to an epic story. To get there, you had to fight your way through the Imperial Air Force, a gauntlet of battles set on the Blackjack's deck. The dungeon itself was a twisting labyrinth of blasted earth, with transporters moving the heroes around through enormous digestive tracts, all with the backdrop of the distant continents floating far below, and set to the tones of an imposing soundtrack. The battle with the Ultima weapon was an intimidating showdown, and the scene at the heart of the floating continent was spellbinding. Celis's moment of truth, proving her loyalty to the heroes, the power of the Warring Triad unleashed, the shock of seeing Kefka drop Emperor Gestal to his doom, and the horrifying moment when the villain disturbs the balance of the Warring Triad, setting off a cataclysm that will rearrange the face of the world. With how much had already happened at this point in the story, and how grand the floating continent felt, you would have been forgiven for thinking this was the final battle. And there's a good reason for that, because the game was originally supposed to end on the floating continent. When the team got to work on Final Fantasy VI, only the first half of the script was actually completed, and the second half was a blank slate to be filled in during development. Many ideas were added along the way, including what is arguably the coolest feature of the whole game, the World of Ruin. The original plan called for the heroes to confront Kefka on the floating continent and defeat him just as the world was about to be destroyed. But as the months wore on and the story started to come together, the development team realized the game was coming along more smoothly than they had expected. Because of this, they were able to free up some time in the schedule before the impending release and implement a massive new feature. A big plot twist to cap off the game and a second world full of adventure. Instead of the usual triumph of last minute heroics averting disaster, this would be a story where the villain won and the world was actually destroyed. A story that proved that sometimes power is power and no matter how hard you try, you're not strong enough. And where you might have been settling in to watch the credits roll following a hard earned victory, Instead, you found yourself running for your life from a crumbling landmass, as the world burned around you. But the world's destruction wasn't the end. In some ways, it was just the beginning. Because in the world of ruin, the land of the eternal sunset, the possibilities were endless. With the breaking of the world, 
the story transitioned into a new, exhilarating act. Where the world of balance had been a mostly linear experience, the world of ruin was almost wide open. Where before the story had shepherded you from one exciting moment to the next, now you were free to roam. And the world of ruin, the part of the game that wasn't even supposed to be there, was probably the most fun thing about Final Fantasy VI. But as I'll explain later, all that freedom also came at a cost. When Kefka pushes the warring triad out of alignment, the world of balance ceases to exist. The Returners escape the floating continent as it breaks apart beneath their feet, but the Blackjack is ripped to pieces in the ensuing cataclysm, and the heroes are lost. One year later, Sully's awakens on a deserted island to find herself in the care of her adopted grandfather, Sid. After surviving her very own Dark Knight of the Soul, Sully's escapes the island on a raft put together by Sid and sets off to reunite with her missing friends. It's really only after you reach the World of Ruin that Final Fantasy VI opens up and becomes the freewheeling open world adventure that many people have in their head when they think of the game. After deciding to implement the World of Ruin, the team started to think about how the game should play out after the end of the world. Building on the idea that every character is the protagonist, they decided to make the second half of Final Fantasy VI a more open-ended, player-driven experience. The result was a world of unrivaled freedom, and once you got your wings back and returned to the skies of the ruined world, a seemingly infinite playground lay open before you. No more structure, no more restrictions, just a world full of things to do and secrets to find. With the heroes scattered to the winds by the Cataclysm, and only three characters required to beat the game, you had a total of 11 optional party members to track down. There were hidden dungeons to find, like the Dreamscape, the Phoenix Cave, and the Zone Eater's Belly, which was accessed by being sucked into the mouth of a massive monster. There was fantastic treasure to loot, like the Scimitar, Gem Box, and Offering. There were amazing spells and abilities to find, like Sabin's Bum Rush, Edgar's Air Anchor, and the incomparable Ultima spell. And of course, there was plenty of magicite to hunt down, like Bahamut, which was guarded by Doomgaze, a horrifying monster that roamed the skies and could strike at any moment, and Crusader, which had you searching the world for eight legendary dragons to challenge and destroy. And then there was the Colosseum, Final Fantasy VI's optional fighting arena provided one of the series' first truly engaging post-game features. Here, you could wager any item in the game for a chance to win another, hopefully better item. Since your chosen champion would have to fight alone, and you couldn't control the character in battle, getting through the toughest fights could take a lot of prep work and figuring out the sequence of fights that would turn a useless item into something priceless could be a lot of fun. And once you'd done everything else, you could grind like crazy. You could boost the heroes to level 99, master every spell on every character, roam the Velt for hours on end trying to collect all of Gao's hundreds of rages, or you could farm dinosaurs for imp gear, then turn your whole party into adorable, unstoppable killing machines. And once you tired of your freedom, you still had one last challenge waiting for you. At the center of the rearranged southern continent, in the spot once occupied by the imperial capital of Vector, surrounded by spirals of broken earth and the scattered debris of shattered civilization, rose the dread spire of Kefka's Tower. In the English version, Final Fantasy VI's spectacular final dungeon is simply named Kefka's Tower. But its original Japanese name is Gareki no To, the Tower of Rubble. And this dungeon, an insane mashup of the Imperial Palace, the Magitech Research Facility, and the Floating Continent, is the perfect emblem of the World of Ruin, both in theme and mechanics. To take best advantage of the game's ensemble cast and the open-ended nature of the World of Ruin, Kefka's Tower splits the heroes into three groups that must take on the final dungeon from three directions at once. 
the parties start separated and have to navigate separate routes, each with its own set of enemies, bosses and rewards, to reach a common goal. The split path approach added a puzzle-like quality to the dungeon and made for a memorable experience. But best of all, the final dungeon was a chance to finally flex your full lineup, a reason to polish off your least used characters and an excuse to go grinding for spells and gear. Kefka's Tower was a great final set piece. It had a host of devious enemies, a bunch of savage bosses and plenty of treasure to claim. But the best thing about the final dungeon was the confrontation at the top. When it came to delivering spectacle and drama, Final Fantasy VI went above and beyond in every conceivable way, and nowhere in the game is this ambition more clearly on display than in the dramatic final confrontation with Kefka. After a long argument between heroes and villain, it all came down to a final battle to settle the fate of the broken world, and the game didn't pull any punches in setting the stage. The conclusive encounter was divided into four different sections as you clawed your way up the tiers of the Statue of the Gods, a menagerie of shapes and bodies fused into a bizarre blend of flesh and machine, all drawn from the most deviant imaginations of Tetsuya Nomura, before finally facing up to Kefka himself in the form of the new god of magic. Drawing on the game's dynamic party structure and large cast, the final battle was prefaced by a unique configuration screen where you're given the opportunity to arrange your full roster of heroes by the order you wanted to send them into the fray. The first four would take the stage at the start and they'd keep on fighting for as long as they're able. But each time you battle your way to a new tier, any characters that had been knocked out would be automatically removed from the party and replaced with the next character in line. The idea of fighting four bosses in a row and potentially burning through your whole roster of heroes in the process was utterly mind-blowing at the time, and the final battle was an absolute spectacle, weathering the barrage of strange and powerful abilities originating from the unnamed parts of each boss was daunting and disorienting. The design of the enemies themselves was imposing, even intimidating and the brutal radiance of the backdrop to Kefka's final form signaled that we'd reached a higher level, a place closer to heaven or hell than to earth. The entire sequence was so over the top, it was frankly stunning. It was a final battle that held us kids spellbound, and whoever had the courage to hold the controller gripped it in shaking hands, sweat beating on their forehead as the rest of us gathered in the room to watch from the sidelines, staring slack-jawed in disbelief that anything, anywhere, could be this amazing. And through it all, the finishing touch, the final battle's unforgettable music. But before we get into that, we must first set the stage. It's finally time to talk about Final Fantasy VI's legendary soundtrack. It's impossible to overstate the importance of a good soundtrack. Great music makes mediocre stories seem good and lifts great ones to godlike heights. And no genre of video games better embodies this fact than the JRPG. There's a serious argument to be made that Final Fantasy VI has one of the most important video game soundtracks ever composed. And for those of us who first felt its impact back in 1994, the music hit hard. Composer Nobuo Uematsu had been with the series since the very beginning, and his work had steadily improved with each title. But the sixth game's soundtrack stands apart as the series' first unassailable masterpiece. I've already mentioned the striking effect of the opening theme and the stunning compositions of the opera scene, but Final Fantasy VI's soundtrack went far beyond embellishing just a few key moments. Every single part of the game was enriched by its music. The phantom train mimicked the rhythmic clacks of a train engine setting off along the rails before leading into a haunting orchestral piece that evoked a procession of ghosts marching into the afterlife. Mm -hmm. 
Magitech research facility wove in mechanical sounds like the clanging of hammers, firing of pistons, and bursts of steam to catch the dungeon's industrial vibe. And Esper World added vibrato and echo to harrowing flute and anxious piano repetitions, providing the perfect backdrop for chilling revelations. But it wasn't just that the individual compositions were of a higher caliber than the ones from the previous games. It was more about how everything fit together to create an overall feeling of epic drama and high adventure. Almost every character had their own theme that captured their personal essence and helped tell their story. From Kafka's unique mix of militaristic menace and carnival whimsy. to the cool detachment of shadow. The stoic sorrow of Cyan. And the youthful genius of Realm. The soundtrack also recycled less of its music than the previous games. Instead, Uematsu worked heavily with late motifs, recurring musical phrases associated with specific characters or locations. Salis' theme is rearranged in Aria de Mezzo Caratere, making both tracks stronger as a result. Edgar and Sabin rears its head in Coin of Fate, and the triumphant spirit of Locke's theme is turned right on its head in its dark mirror, the heart-wrenching Forever Rachel. Uematsu's work also benefited from an overall increase in sound quality, largely owing to the addition of a dedicated sound team that helped translate Uematsu's compositions into the Super Nintendo's hardware with the highest possible fidelity. At this point, Uematsu knew exactly how hard and how far he could push the Super Nintendo's sound chip, and it's incredible just how well the game's soundtrack holds up even today. I must have heard a hundred different versions of the decisive battle over the years, and there still hasn't been one I prefer to the original. All of this came together brilliantly in the game's final battle, the culmination of all of Uematsu's efforts up until this point. A dash of genius, a pinch of frenzied effort, and a generous serving of accumulated experience from the first five titles. By far the game's most impressive composition, Dancing Mad. The single work that defines Final Fantasy VI's soundtrack and its unforgettable villain Kefka for a generation of gamers is the brutally astounding Dancing Mad, an 18-minute symphony in four movements, one for each of the final battles for boss encounters. A bonanza of insane energy that kicks the final battle into the highest of gears and transforms an epic confrontation into a spectacular finale. As you might imagine, Dancing Mad was a product of passion. While Uematsu would normally reach a natural limit around a couple of minutes of length for each track, with Dancing Mad he just couldn't stop. He kept working on it, extending it, playing around with it, until the piece had swelled into an absolute monstrosity worthy of Kefka's sadistic pageantry. The symphony interweaves the opening theme, Kafka's theme, parts of Catastrophe which plays when the world is broken, and even Kafka's distinctive laugh, a sound which has haunted the heroes throughout the game. Dancing Mad is one of, if not the most ambitious video game compositions ever made, 
and a perfect capstone to one of the most influential, important, and frankly amazing soundtracks of all time. Final Fantasy 4 and 5 both had great music, but Final Fantasy 6 is the first game in the series that truly wields its soundtrack like a weapon to inflict lasting emotional damage, and it's Dancing Mad that strikes the final blow. The final battle with Kefka was a truly amazing sequence. The only problem was getting to this point in the first place, because once you found yourself in the world of ruin, it was very easy to lose sight of the bigger picture. Final Fantasy VI was far from the perfect game. Some story arcs never really went anywhere, some plot points weren't given time to develop, and the world building was all over the place. There's also a lot of stuff that was left on the table. Selyes never talks about Kefka or why she came to leave the Empire. Terra's relationship with her father is never explored, and the sequence where Locke and Terra travel to Tomasa feels like a natural place to once again branch the story, letting us play out Edgar's information gathering intrigue in the Imperial capital and Setzer's efforts to repair the Blackjack as concurrent scenarios. But most of these failings can be easily explained by the technical limitations of the time. Where the dialogue seems sparse, the story undercooked, and the scenes undeveloped, the fact is that they simply didn't have the space for more content. And it's only in hindsight that the flaws show up at all. The only real criticism that could be leveled at the game is about the structure of the second half. For all the merits of its open-ended nature, the World of Ruin is a double-edged sword, because by the time you reach it, the story is pretty much done. After leaving the solitary island, Selyse treks overland to the town of Nikea, where she bumps into Edgar, who's masquerading as the leader of a gang of bandits. She tracks the bandits to South Figaro, where they infiltrate the burrowed Figaro castle, which had become trapped beneath the sands following the cataclysm. After helping Edgar restore his lost home, the two heroes journey to Kolingen, where they find Setzer wallowing in his own misery at the local pub. After convincing the disillusioned gambler to take up the fight once more, the three of them set off to the tomb of Setzer's dear departed friend, Daryl, to retrieve her most prized possession, the world's only remaining airship, the Falcon. Final Fantasy VI took what was so cool about Final Fantasy V's unstructured endgame and cranked it up to 11. From the moment you get your hands on the Falcon, you can raid Kefka's tower at any time. You'll have a really hard time with only a handful of underleveled heroes, but the fact that you have the option at all is super cool. You could challenge yourself to beat the final dungeon with only three characters. You can gather the whole team and enter as the game intended, or you can grind like crazy and straight up murder your way through the tower. But all that freedom came at a price. With so much stuff to do and more ways to enjoy it than ever before, the world of Ruin was the ultimate diversion. And once you got started, it was hard to stop. Which could be a bit of a problem. Just like many of the open world games of modern times, getting lost in side content can be a dangerous thing. The world of Ruin is a lot of fun, but it's missing a central force that drives the story. By the time most players tackle the final dungeon, they haven't seen or heard from the game's villain in hours and hours. The main story seems like a distant memory of something long past, and as cool as the final battle is, it honestly feels just as optional as everything else in the world of Ruin. Good stories tend to build their narratives around a rising tension that peaks near the end. In Final Fantasy V, the freedom you had in tackling the endgame was balanced against a growing menace. With each step forward the heroes took, the villain also flexed his might. But in Final Fantasy VI's World of Ruin, the stakes get lower the further you get. With every ally you recover, the tension falters. And Kefka, who was so proactive in the world of balance, now just hangs back and waits for the end to come. And really, by the time you reach him, the heroes have already won. The confrontation with Kefka atop his Tower of Rubble serves as the game's climax. But it's not where the story is decided. The real decisive battle is fought on Solitary Island. And it takes place entirely inside a person's heart.
In a game with many great characters, my personal favorite has always been Sally's. She's a powerful warrior, but she's also intelligent, artistic, and emotional. She's equally comfortable wearing armor and wielding a sword as she is performing on the stage in an evening gown. She's loyal, brave, and uncompromising in her ideals. But above all, she's incredibly human. And for all her strength, she's sometimes very weak. The defining moment of Celis's character is the pivotal role she plays in the game's most important scene. The one where the fate of the world is actually decided. Final Fantasy VI's central theme is the power of hope. And way back in the world of balance, Bannon, the leader of the Returners, states the message outright when he tells the story of Pandora's box. Though Bannon is trying to encourage Terra to join the fight against an overwhelming foe, the real takeaway is this. Even in a world ruled by evil, life is still worth living. The game's darkest moment comes in the aftermath of the world's destruction, when Celis awakens on Solitary Island after the disaster on the floating continent. She finds herself on the brink of despair. Her friends are scattered and her quest is over. The world is lost and the villain has won. She still has one last ray of light, the love of her adopted grandfather, Sid, but she's about to lose that too. Before she can even get her bearings in this cruel new world, Sid falls deathly ill, and it's up to Celis to nurse him back to health. Here, in the game's most harrowing sequence, Sid's life is actually in your hands. And if it's your first time playing the game, there's a very real chance he's going to die. Sid's death is the final heartbreaking blow. Celis was hanging on by a single thread, and now that thread's been cut her grief too heavy for her heart to bear. She climbs the island's tallest cliff and throws herself into the sea. Celis is done with the world, but the world isn't done with Celis. By stroke of fate, she washes up on the beach alive. And as Celis considers how to feel about surviving, a bird distracts her from her death wish, a bird with a piece of blue cloth wrapped around its wounded wing. Recognizing the cloth as Locke's bandana, Celis takes it for a sign. The man she loves might still be out there somewhere, waiting to be found. Hope is still alive. Before the final battle, Kefka asks the heroes why they bother trying, when they know the things they build will eventually be destroyed. But there is no single answer to this question. Each of the game's heroes has to find their own reason among the ruins of the broken world. And even though the final battle still left to fight, at this point, they've already won. Because the real fight wasn't against Kefka, it was against despair. Standing up to Kefka means rejecting despair. The world of ruin without Kefka might eventually heal, but defeating the villain is not going to save it. The true test of courage is to find the strength to accept that the world he broke is still worth living in. That's the lesson the World of Ruin taught the heroes. Despair drove Celis to the edge of the abyss, but hope brought her back. The hope of seeing Locke again gave Celis the strength to carry on, to leave Solitary Island and begin searching for her friends. And the choice she made after finding Locke's bandana, the choice to believe, to go on living, is the crucial choice that saved the world. Celis's leap of despair is the story's darkest hour but it's also the springboard for the rebirth of hope, and it serves as the perfect setup for Final Fantasy VI's most glorious moment. When Celis takes her first hopeful steps through the world Kefka destroyed, the initial overland theme is a funeral dirge that evokes images of the half-dead marching through eternal gloom. But all of this is set to change. In the depths of Daryl's tomb, the dungeon's dank ambience is changed for the acoustic tones of a melancholy arrangement of Setzer's theme, as the gambler's memories of Daryl come flooding back. At the bottom of the stairs, when Setzer stands on the deck of the Falcon for the first time in many years, the gentle music stops. And as the story takes its final turn, and the Falcon rises from the ocean, the opening bars of a new composition announces the rebirth of hope.
The melancholy masterpiece, Searching for Friends, has always been my favorite track from Final Fantasy VI, but I never fully knew why until now. Because this piece of music embodies the game's spirit. It's the perfect mix of soul-wrenching sadness and heartwarming hope. Because from this point onward, hope is reborn, and the heroes of Final Fantasy VI are no longer wandering the wasteland. They're searching for friends. Before I go on, I just want to say if you enjoyed this video, I'd be super grateful if you could hit the like button and leave a quick comment, as it really helps the video reach more people. And if you want to support me, consider subscribing to my channel, so I know people want to see more videos like this. Also, I've prepared a special thank you to some of my most vocal supporters, so if you've been around for a while, be sure to watch till the very end. Every JRPG fan has their first great love that first great game that introduced them to the magic of the experience and made them a lifelong fan of the genre. The game they'll defend for the rest of their lives, no matter how flawed it might seem in the eyes of others. For me, that game is Final Fantasy VI. But it's one thing to love a game, and another thing to explain why. And the point of a retrospective is to look into the past and help others put the game into context to see it not as it is today, but as it was back then when it was brand new. Final Fantasy VI took the story-first paradigm from Final Fantasy IV and honed it to a fine point. The game was designed to tell a grand and gripping story that evoked real emotions, even if it came at the expense of what was seen as proper RPG gameplay at the time. Sequences like the Opera House, with its long cutscenes and heavy dialogue, were seen as risky, and by some, as contrary to what the RPG genre should be all about. But in hindsight, these special moments were transformational for the genre, and lodged deep in the hearts of a generation of gamers who were struck silent with awe when Celis began to sing. And yet, Final Fantasy VI's gameplay didn't suffer for its grander story. The game had more variety than ever before, more things to see and more things to do. And with the inclusion of the World of Ruin, with all of its freedom, Final Fantasy VI offered the most open-ended experience we'd ever seen in a video game. Everything about Final Fantasy VI hit harder than the previous games. The development team poured everything they had into this ultra-premium product, and Final Fantasy VI honestly felt too good to be true. From the lavish intro, the orchestral soundtrack, the fairy tale graphics, the engaging story and characters and the sheer volume of content, it felt almost like there'd been a mistake and we'd been given something we weren't meant to have. I sometimes get the feeling that younger gamers view these older titles as some sort of primitive prototypes, incomplete products that provided a rudimentary experience while we waited impatiently for the real deal to be developed. But there was nothing rudimentary about Final Fantasy VI in 1994. To us, it was perfect. What the hardware couldn't render, our imaginations did and the tiny sprite-based characters and 16-bit scenes became vividly real in our minds. Back then, the feeling of taking to the skies in the Falcon to explore the world of ruin was absolutely magical. The world stretched out in every direction, seemingly boundless and filled with secrets beyond counting. And even now, every time I hear the first notes of searching for friends, a part of my mind travels back to those days of wonder in the mid-90s, when I was still a child. Every day was a new adventure and nothing seemed impossible. Final Fantasy VI was not just a game, but a work of art. It was Square's first masterpiece, and in my opinion, the first masterpiece JRPG. But of course, it's all subjective. This has not been a documentary, but a love letter. And I am not a scholar. I'm just a passionate fan trying to give voice to others like me. 
At the end of this exhaustingly long video, I want to pay tribute to those of you who made it happen. This is my way of saying a heartfelt thank you to some of my most supportive viewers, and by extension, to everyone who's had my back these past few years. These retrospectives take an enormous effort to produce, and it all runs on pure passion. I'll keep going as long as I'm having fun, but it's sometimes very hard and tedious work, and I often think about quitting. So whenever I get those thoughtful, kind, supportive comments that cheer me on, it really lights up my day and motivates me to keep at it. Thank you.